Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the protein kinase C pathway. Okay, so we're finally discussing the different types of protein kinase C and how they're going to be activated by the calcium that we've released into the ER and the diacylglycerol molecules which we produced in the uh, inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so we've discussed the conventional protein kinase Cs, which need both the calcium and the diacylglycerol to activate them. We're now going to discuss the novel protein kinase Cs, which only require the diacylglycerol. They do not require the calcium signal, and I'll explain why this is in a moment. So remember, the novel protein kinase Cs include protein kinase C delta, protein kinase C epsilon, protein kinase C eta, and protein kinase C theta. Okay, right. So once again, the inactive novel protein kinase C sits within the cytoplasm, and the active protein kinase C will be recruited to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, by the diacylglycerol that's there. Okay, so let's start by drawing the inactive protein kinase C. Okay, so again, we'll start by drawing the catalytic domain here, which is the domain that's actually capable of adding phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues. Okay, and then instead of having a C2 domain coming right off this, instead we go straight into our C1B domain. We then have our C1A domain here. Okay, so they're still nicely in tandem, meaning that they repeat, they, sorry, that they follow one another. Okay, then you have the pseudo substrate sticking off here. Okay, so that's the pseudo substrate this time. And then you have this final domain over here, which is known as the novel C2 domain. And then the amino terminal domain is down here. Okay, and this is the carboxylic acid terminal here. Right. So this domain that I'm colouring in in purple here, this is the pseudo substrate, okay, and this is the portion that's sitting within the catalytic domain, or well, within the active site of our catalytic domain, and is inhibiting it. Okay, and I've spelt this wrong, pseudo substrate. Okay, right. So this is stopping our catalytic domain from actually adding phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues within proteins. Okay, now, this final domain over here at the amino terminal portion here, okay, which I'll colour in blue here, this is what's known as the novel C2 domain. Now, the novel C2 domain does not recognize calcium, so it does not bind calcium, and it doesn't uh, activate the um, protein kinase C enzyme when calcium binds to it. Okay, so this is a novel C2 domain which doesn't recognize calcium like the original C2 domain. Okay, but the C1A and C1B domains, these are still completely functional within novel protein kinase Cs, and they still recognize diacylglycerol molecules, and when diacylglycerol goes up within the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, and what will happen is the novel protein kinase C enzyme will migrate up to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, and the C1A and C1B domain will bind to these diacylglycerol molecules, as shown here. So here's C1A, and here is C1B, and this will change the conformation of the enzyme so that the pseudo substrate is pulled out of the active site of the catalytic domain. So let's show this. So here is our catalytic domain, like so. Here is our carboxylic acid terminus down here. And now what's going to happen is the pseudo substrate is going to be sitting over here, nicely tucked away from our uh, catalytic domain and no longer inhibiting it. Okay, and here is our novel C2 domain. So let's cover, color in this picture then now. So we'll start with the diacylglycerol molecules. Here are the glycerol molecules of those diacylglycerol molecules. And then we've got the two long chain carboxylic acids in orange. Okay, we've then got our C1A and our C2A 
sorry, C1B rather, um, domains, which are bound to those diacylglycerols. Okay, we've got our novel C2 domain, which isn't doing anything, and is over here. Okay, we've got the pseudo substrate, which now is nicely not blocking the catalytic domain. Okay, now I'll abbreviate pseudo substrate to PS here. And then finally, let's give the um, catalytic domain a color. So we'll color the catalytic domain in, in pink here, and this will now be active and it will phosphorylate serine and threonine residues within proteins. Okay, so we've now activated our novel protein kinase C. So again, this pathway is capable of activating the novel protein kinase Cs because we are producing the diacylglycerol, which is needed to activate these novel protein kinase Cs. Finally, let's turn our attention to the atypical protein kinase Cs, which we can probably just about squeeze in here, okay? So remember, the atypical protein kinases, they're not going to be activated by the pathway that we've spent so long discussing. Okay, they have their own weird and wonderful pathways. But just for a complete discussion of the protein kinases, let's mention them, okay, so that you're not afraid of them. So we have protein kinase C zeta and protein kinase C iota. Okay, here. Now, Basically, their structure contains an atypical C1 domain, and then it contains nothing that bears any resemblance to a C2 domain. Okay, so let's draw their structure here. And initially, I'll show their inactivated structure. Okay, so here is the catalytic domain. Okay, then they have a structure that's called the atypical C1 domain. And we'll show this here. Then they have the pseudo substrate coming in and blocking the active site of the catalytic domain. And then they have an unusual domain which is involved in their activation, which is known as the PBI domain. Okay, so this is the PBI. And then after that, then you have the amino terminus. So here's the amino terminus, here's the carboxylic acid terminus. So let's label up the portions here. We've got our catalytic domain, which is the portion that will phosphorylate serine and threonine residues when it doesn't have the pseudo substrate annoyingly uh, sat within it and blocking its activity. Okay, so here is the catalytic domain. Then at the moment, sitting within the catalytic domain, we have our pseudo substrate, which I'll label up as PS for pseudo substrate. And then this special domain here is known as the atypical C1 domain, okay? And what's atypical about it is that it does not bind to uh, diacylglycerol molecules, which means that now these atypical protein kinase Cs are not going to be activated by diacylglycerol molecules, and therefore they're not activated by calcium because they don't have a C2 domain, they're not activated by diacylglycerol, they're not activated by any of the things that we've produced looking at this G-protein coupled pathway that we have done. Okay, so they're not going to be activated by the pathways we've looked at. And finally, this domain down here, which is PBI, this is a domain that can be activated by protein-protein interactions. So other proteins are capable of coming in here and interacting with this PBI domain and will trigger a conformational change that will move the pseudo substrate out of the active site of the catalytic domain and hence activate the atypical protein kinase C. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of the protein kinase C pathway. Overall, what we've discussed, the pathway we've discussed, will lead to the activation of both the um, conventional protein kinase C enzymes, protein kinase C alpha, protein kinase C beta 1, protein kinase C beta 2, and protein kinase C gamma, and also the novel protein kinase Cs, protein kinase C delta, epsilon, eta, and theta. Okay, and these will phosphorylate serine and threonine residues on an entire plethora of targets.